today. Uh, really appreciate it. Hope you are not too sad about missing an hour of sleep uh, last <laughs> night. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for being here. I'm really excited to introduce Julie Zhu. Um, Julie came over from Ann Arbor, but is a resident of many places, has been an artist and a resident in many places. Um, Julie is a composer, artist, and carolinist. Uh, her work is conceptual and transdisciplinary, operating on an expansive definition of algorithm. Um, and she's currently a presidential postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan, where she is working on creative and ethical use of AI and machine learning in the arts as one of her research interests. Um, and she's an advocate for intermedia compositions, and so she does a lot of collaborating with artists all over the world. So we're super lucky to have Julie here today. Um, she is going to be talking about her obsession with the sound of writing and drawing, and how it's played an important role in her collaborations, uh, from chamber compositions to video installations to spatial audio experiments. And she's also going to talk about this new digital co-performer that's a work in progress that is currently being developed using deep learning models trained on her drawing. So let's welcome Julie. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks, Molly. Uh, I'll just start. Yeah, so um, this really wouldn't, this has been a multi-year long thing for me since I would say since I was a kid, I was drawing, but really the sound of drawing wasn't in my consciousness until, I don't know, like 2013 or 14. And so all these institutions have really supported my work, and I wanted to give them a shout out. Um, so today, we will kind of split this presentation into three bits. The first is a little bit of context of why I'm doing this, some of my previous work, and then um, really get into the current project of the deep learning model. And uh, then we'll have a little break and um, we'll, I'll diffuse this piece that's around 30 minutes um, that I performed live um, last year at Bing Studio. And uh, then we'll like turn off the lights and we'll be very meditative. Um, and yeah, so like the reason I love, the reason I'm thinking about the sound of drawings because before I was a composer, I was a painter in New York City. And um, I love painting. These, this was like a huge painting, like the size of this wall. And I called it my last painting because it was kind of my last painting. And the reason I didn't want to paint anymore was because I put my work up in a gallery and someone looks at it for a second and moves on. And that's totally fine. I mean, paintings, you live with them. Like, I think that's one of the nice things about paintings. But I wanted to hold people and I wanted to control them kind of like in a concert hall. Um, so I wanted time to be in the painting. So then it's like you can see in the previous slide, I started making my paintings longer and they became more like graphic scores. And in looking at them, the element of time is in the looking. Um, so I, you know, but I was also a Carolinist. I was the Carolinist of St. Thomas Church Fifth Avenue next to MoMA. And so I had been playing music for most of my life and some people, my friends, asked me to write something for them, kind of out of the blue, and this was it. Um, and you can hear. This first piece was kind of a breakthrough for me because instead of I wrote out the words that the percussionist would write, and that was what, that was the sound of it. And in this piece, instead of the cello being the main instrument, the cello was the percussion, sort of like the punctuation, and the writing was really the, the main show. 
Um, so it was on this poem by um, this amazing poet, uh, and it was, and he committed suicide unfortunately in 2017. But um, for me, it was it was about like when you write something down, it's real, and even for kids nowadays, if you if you if they write it down, their their attainment is just so much better than if they're typing it on the computer. Um, and here, like when you listen to the sound of what they're writing, you were still standing there is so meaningful, but it's kind of divorced from what you hear. Um, what I love about it is like, if you think about writing, I love you, and you think about writing, I hate you, it ostensibly could sound the same because it's I word you. Um, yet, I believe that you could tell probably in the writing of it, whether someone wrote, I love you or wrote, I hate you. Um, and, uh, and I also loved that after someone performs this, where the, the paper that they're writing on their table, it becomes like ephemera as part of the performance. It could be a score for a next piece. Or I love that as, not we're not only producing sound we're producing something visual and so the next time i thought about drawing and so 2017 was when i decided okay i'm going to become a composer um and here i was working with this program called chuck and taking um the sound of drawing and realizing that i could spatialize it um which really opened my world um, because then you could be inside of the sound. It's not like a sound that's localized, that's just for you. It's like you're within the drawing. It can, it can become huge. Um, so then the following year, I thought, well, let's go back to the intimate. And I made these series published in Jitterzine of a performance by oneself for oneself and essentially you're tracing the scribbles on the left according to the instructions on the right and the poem is also instructions that is and um, you can sort of vary the tempo so you can imagine scribbling these it's very rhythmical it's like a um, these lines can be gestural can be really um, poetic. Uh, and I had imagined that you would just put like a piece of vellum over that left side and you know, you'd be just tracing it. And it's sort of like for a lot, to be distributed widely um, and you don't have to amplify it. Um, and you can see, and meanwhile I'm composing lots of other things, but this is like a real through line because the next year I had the opportunity to work with a percussion trio and instead of making them play instruments, I made them draw on three boards. But according specifically to uh, telling them exactly where to draw, you can see there's a grid telling them like on the left side, on the right side, exactly what they're drawing, specific instructions and rhythms of how they're doing it. Um, so it really, I wanted this not only to be interesting to listen to, but interesting to look at as well. So I thought sort of heuristically that um, I could teach anyone to make a cool contemporary drawing. Um, and it's true, I feel like it's, it's like improvisation, like you have these opposites that you work with, you know, dense and free, large and small. And, you know, and musicians are sometimes not as, you know, they, people often say to me, like, I can't draw, but you totally can if I've instructed you specifically how to do it. And they did an amazing job line upon line. They're based in Austin. Um, and I think for the audience, you can f move between listening and seeing, which I'm still working on. Um, I don't know if this, I think there could be, 
like another iteration of this. Um, and again, sort of the drawing can be left as ephemera or um, a document of the piece. And then we're just going to, through the years, and this was actually recorded at ESS, which is um, working with cellist Seth Parker Woods. And this time, instead of about really talking about the sound of drawing, I'm taking something that's drawn, having him improvise it, and then transcribing that improvisation. And then doing that once over, but then layering on top new improvisation. Um, but I really wanted to include this because it's right here, just, just over there. Um, and finally, the next year, in 2022, I made a little drawing instrument for myself which was essentially two contact mics underneath a box and using Max and sonifying the drawing. Um, and the reason for it is because I, f I tried to figure out different configurations of how one might go about this, but it turns out if you just connect to a microphone to a speaker, it's the best way to get like the spatiality of drawing you know this is the stereo and you hear it very clearly going from left to right left to right And it's really hard to recreate, actually, um, because the amplitude data is pretty noisy. And the main thing that allows us to figure out the space of the sound is the time difference. When you can have a direct connection between the microphone and the speaker, then that's what creates it, like a sound from the left reaches us just a tiny bit sooner than the sound on the right. Um, and so then it makes us really feel like the sound is moving. Um, and so I thought, well, for people to really focus on the sound, I should, I should hide the performer. And because if, if I'm drawing from left to right, you can see me. And actually, I just want you to focus on the sound. Um, so this was at IRCOM, which is this sound institute um, in Paris, and it was uh, for a percussionist inside of this big box, um, Olivia Martin, and she's amazing. And there's these questions of like, is it acousmatic music? Is it live? Like, what's inside? Um, sort of... Like, are people actually imagining what is being drawn? It's there's, there's kind of a mystery. And um, the box actually also served a nice, you know, it also was a feedback barrier. It was like, it was something else that I didn't really consider. Like, as we have, you can see a lot of instruments and a lot of microphones inside. Um, and then there's big speakers outside. And... Part of this, he used some machine learning. There was um, a spectral analysis to categorize gesture, and then a lot of different synthesis techniques and fixed electronics, and then um, and everything. Most everything was live, though. And this was this is something that I probably change in the future, and I will change. And it, it might be in Chicago actually um, next year. Is people didn't think that there was anyone inside, which is such a pity. Um, because if, <laughs> like creating something live is much more difficult than just being at a computer and making sure everything's perfect and then playing it through speakers. So it, 
I mean, I would I would have loved if people could see Olivia Martin inside. Um, this is just one excerpt of it, but that point is recognized by Max Patch because of the special characteristics, and it's triggering a sound file that she has to react to on a bass drum. So it's on a random timer. It's just like one example, like a very simple machine learning um, that you that you can use in Max. Um, like these were just triggered by the sound of her pen rather than like someone pressing spacebar. Um, and the way I did that was through this, um, something called MUBU and through GMM, the Gaussian mixture model. And it's just essentially categorizing sound. So you train it with like, what I did was I trained fingers on wood, pencil on wood, the point of the pencil on wood, you know, like also pen on wood. And these are all different spectral characteristics. That means like, um, just like a different signature, oral signature for each sound. Um, and then you can say, well, it's that category. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to filter or I'm going to trigger this. It's kind of like your own, like, MIDI controller, but just with a surface. Um, and, uh, and I would say from this project is where the idea for a deep learning model came. It's because the score for the percussionist was essentially this animation that I made for her. It's too hard to notate like what you're supposed to draw, when you're supposed to draw. So I just recorded myself drawing it, and this was the score. And to me, it would be really cool if a computer generated this or tried to generate it from just the sound. And that was the seed of the idea of the deep learning model that I'll be talking about in the second part. You'll hear a lot of this in the next talk, <laughs> in, this, in the next few minutes. Um, so then the next year, I thought, well, um, what if I put myself in a box? And it wasn't so big. Like, it was trying to do version two of the thing in Paris. And so this box is four feet by four feet by four feet. And... And because I was in, sh and at that time, GPT-3 had just come out, I think. And instead of using that GPT-3, um, I used GPT-2 um, and I trained it. It's like essentially like a, like a fine tuning model of that GPT-2 model. And we can, I'll talk a little bit about these proprietary models and how we feel about them. But this one, I just took Flatland and I said, just focus on this text. And so I wanted to give it my that particular data. Um, and so, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic, like if, if we're, we get access to some of these models that we can manipulate them in an ethical way for our own uses. For example, the some of the generate like some some of the things that were generated were were really fun. So I asked it to give me examples to finish in the beginning, and it's pretty amazing. A new beginning, a wing binging, world around me in a sudden shaking circle. And the next one is in the beginning, number one, number two, number three, above. Um, o king. And uh, in the beginning, the word I, like I was so impressed and inspired, like in the beginning, start of line, end of line, you know, like I was really impressed with them um, and it's, yeah, and with what it gave me. 
And what I wanted to do was to write these things and have it be my written libretto and feed it through this slot in the box. So I don't know if you, the slot is sort of on the left side and I just feed the paper through that you'd be able to see like what I was writing, but you'd first hear it. Um, and uh, yeah, so four feet is actually a lot of space, it turns out, um, if you're sitting down. And it was, this piece was also controlled by Max. Um, but instead of using spat, used um, like ambisonics from ICST in Zurich. And uh, yeah, and it was, it was scored uh, specifically through a call, this um, object in Max. And I thought I would improvise for maybe 10 minutes, but it turned out I improvised for about 30, 35 minutes. And that's what you're gonna hear today, is me sitting inside this box uh, drawing circles. Um, and yeah, you can tell me afterwards what you, whether you find it interesting or not. Um, but I wanted to go through, like, I'm not the first person to think about drawing and the sound of drawing. So I wanted to, you know, talk a little bit about other people. And Will Kim is someone I met um, in Europe. He's in Stuttgart. And um, instead of drawing on wood, he's drawing on canvas. And sort of like that Toccata, that piece for three percussionists, he scored exactly how you're going to draw the rhythm and everything um, with the cello. Um, and this piece by Mark Affelbaum is really fun because you can see that it's really small, but you can see that all the rhythms are the same for each person drawing on a surface, but they're drawing vastly different things. So they're in unison, but you have five different pictures, which I think if done well, is just absolutely amazing. Um, and then Daphne Oram in 1957, which is amazing, use this sort of, it's not exactly the sound of drawing, but use drawing to create a synthesizer, sort of like the opposite of an oscilloscope. Um, it's like there's this light table underneath, sort of shooting waves, and where you block off um, generates sound. Um, and she's amazing. And finally, um, Jesper Norden had been thinking about drawing on a Wacom tablet for a long time and made this, like he was also at IRCOM for a while and made this instrument that sort of took grains of sound on an X, Y axis. And as you drew, would be able to take, say like a piece of music or some sound files and you'd be able to draw through it, kind of like composing. And in this excerpt, instead of, drawing on um, on a surface. There's like a camera and you have like a 2D space in front of you to draw. And I think now he's doing a lot of work with uh, video games and like VR experiences so that, you know, when your character jumps or something, like the trajectory of your jump can control the music that's playing. Um, and so, yeah, has built a whole business out of this like one Max patch that he made, I don't know, 20 years ago. Um, so yeah, basically that's sort of the end of the context bit. There's still some, I wanted to include so from there, I was thinking, I had some questions. I was like, can I use just four contact mics 
on a drawing surface and can I predict exactly what I'm drawing very accurately? And I think we can without AI, just using localization, right? Kind of like how triangulation works for like Wi-Fi and our cell phones. Um, but I haven't done that yet and maybe I will. Maybe I'll have to do it anyway for, um, for this deep learning. Um, but uh, with deep learning, ostensibly the problem becomes easier. Um, and you'll see that in a bit. But I just wanted to include one last bit about the timbre recognition. It's just really awesome. With a contact mic, you can sort of turn anything into an instrument just because like using doing like this versus doing this is very different and you can there was a kickstarter uh, for emojis this door into a drum kit with emojis gonna load up a kick drum it's not Give available it anymore examples but now it's pretty cool a hi-hat map that to my knuckles now I'm gonna get the snare drum. And the snare drum is gonna be on the door handle. Maybe let's get one more. Let's get the ride cymbal. Up that to the keys. All right, and now I should be able to play it like a drum kit. So it's pretty cool, and my some of my students really, really, really like it. So, um, um, but you'd ha you'd have to make it yourself now. It's not available, and I think it, it would be pretty easy to make. Um, it's not as like nice because it's not a cell phone app, but you can do it on your computer. Okay. Anyway, now it's 2024. We've gone through 2017, 18, 19, 20, one, two, three. Done a project each year on the sound of drawing. And then I go and come to the University of Michigan and someone there named John Granzow is my mentor. And it turns out he's done stuff on the sound of drawing too. Um, and uh, this is what he's made. Um, sort of testing different ways that drawing can be sensed. So you can see that there's a magnometer, there's a conductive fabric, there's like using a camera, infrared camera. Um, and so yeah, like there are so many ways to track drawing. Um, but we're, I'm still thinking about just the simple contact mic. And so this is where this deep drawing comes in, this, the current project. And we have a team at the University of Michigan of me and John, who's an associate professor, Irfan, who's a master's student, and Alex, an undergrad student. And they know way more about AI than I do. Um, so it's really nice to have them on the team. And the objective, like I kind of said, was to create a visual co-performer with me, um, trained on my drawing. Um, and uh, I'm just going to go through the stages. Um, and we're really just in the beginning stages right now. And so first you have to prepare the data. And so I have to record the audio and the video together. And I have to synchronize it. And it's you know, we record audio at 48K. Um, we record video at certain frames per second. How do you really get them to be, it shouldn't be that hard of a problem, but it, yeah, we still have to do it. Um, and also the pre-processing of the audio. Um, that's, this is essentially where we still are. 
Um, and I'll get into that more in, the, in a future slide. Um, and then after sort of you, you clean all your audio, you extract features from the audio. And you have to figure out like which features you want to extract. Um, you can extract the centroid, you can extract like the MFCC, um, you can, lots of these different audio features tell you different things. And which is the best feature for what we're doing, which is understanding like the sound of drawing, which is very, very, very noisy. Um, and then selecting a model for this. And we have lots of models to choose from. Um, there's the convolutional neural network, which is kind of like a, a feed forward model, essentially good for classifying things. It's, it's more like, okay, this, that's what it is. You sort of, you go in one direction or a recurrent neural network, which is like you, you're able to sh store like what you've learned in this neural network in a short term way so that you can kind of go back and figure out whether it's the right fit. And so these, this model is kind of good for sequen sequential things like music or language, um, or you can use both. Like you can like classify with CNNs and then go back like to learn these features and then go back to an RNN to, you know, create your sound. What's, what's CNN stand for? It's convolutional. Convolutional, okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, also, since our data is not, we don't have that much data, I don't know. Like when Google did this drawing model, they had, I don't know, millions of users drawing like cats on the internet. Um, whereas like, it will just be me recording maybe 10 hours worth of data, which means we have to sort of replicate that data. And so there's some, we'll be generating some of the data that's kind of like what I did, but just making more of it. And transformers are interesting because you're able to sort of like look back and look back to see like whether it makes sense. And this sort of adds a lot of time to the model. It's like, um, it, it really can't be real time. Um, so there's sort of kind of two things that we're thinking about, like a real time model and a non real time model. And then, of course, the training, and it'll be supervised learning and generating, and these are sort of like our, like what we're thinking. Batch processing means sort of like it's taking time to make, to make, to generate your output. Um, so this mode one is really thinking about real time, and this one we're going to pursue both modes simultaneously. And the first mode is essentially tracking the tip of the pen. Nothing about generating video, but rather just, it's just like a localization problem, like figuring out the output of the X, Y from the data that we have. And obviously when you have an X, Y coordinate, then you can using you know, JavaScript or whatever, um, you can create visuals. Like it can be like a cloud moving in space. It could be sparkles, like you can do. Um, and I think this is, this is definitely interesting technically, um, just to sort of see if we can do it. And hopefully it uses the same model, but just gives a different, different output. Um, and the visual data is just much simpler so it can be real time right um just an xy coordinate and uh but it still takes sort of the audio and generates this um, xy coordinate and then the second model is one that was the original idea which is instead of generating just an xy coordinate we're generating images frames and then that those frames can be put together like an animation to create like a to create a video, and this is where probably the machine will fail horribly and won't be able to predict exactly what I'm writing or drawing. Um, but maybe maybe it can. Like I think with enough data, we can definitely do some Cold War espionage where like you have microphones underneath the desk of 
you know, someone important, and they write down the coordinates, and you can, like, get the coordinates from those microphones. Um, so, but anyway, it's like a very useless problem to solve, clearly. Like, if I really just wanted people to see what I was drawing, I would just put a camera above where I'm drawing. But I'm, and we, a team, are where we aren't interested in the failure of the machine and and are inspired, I think, and will be inspired by what the machine thinks I'm drawing rather than what it is, what I'm actually drawing. And maybe comparing the two in a performance, um, yeah. Um, it's not so, so much about the difference between a machine and human, but just, just thinking about maybe these useless creative problems um, that AI can solve. Uh, and so this is the box, the new box, and you can see there are four contact mics and the document camera connected to a computer where I record the audio and the video. And I'm just going to go through, you know, what we're doing for pre-processing right now. And just to show sort of like all of the hurdles, this project is going to take a really long time. Um, that we are currently going through. The first of which is noise. Like, first of all, how do you get all the microphones to be at the same level? And if you have answers to these questions that I have, please like, let me know after the talk. Um, it's, each contact microphone is kind of different. Um, and even if you set it at the same level at the very beginning, it's going to record a different range of sound. Um, in addition, there's just so much noise. And these microphones, I've tested lots of contact microphones. And I, I personally feel that AKG 411 is the, is the best tool. It's not too expensive and it's sort of out of the box versus if you solder your own piezos, you know, a lot of things can sort of go wrong. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and what you see here is in Reaper, I'm subtracting the noise, that's the, the red. And I have to subtract the noise for each microphone, specifically. Um, and what you're hearing is sort of when the yellow waveform goes above that red. Um, and we compared two, the sort of the raw and the, and the processed audio. And you can see for these, Audio features, which we collected through Libroso, which is a, pack, a package in Python, um, that th there's a huge difference. So cleaning the audio is really, really important. And these first two audio features talk about this, the timbral aspects of the sound. So the spectrogram Unfortunately, I mean, I think the spectrogram will probably be the most useful thing for us, even though it doesn't look like it, because it looks like it's just like a mass of black. But there's a lot more data in it. And in a lot of machine learning applications and audio, it's kind of counterintuitive. Like, we can gain more information from spectrograms than the actual audio file in through deep learning techniques. And um, the MFCC is as well, except there's sort of like different, different blocks that uh, um, that algorithm uses. Um, in addition, like chroma and bandwidth, you can see that here, there's the normalized is just much more like there's a larger range, like, I don't know if you can see but like, zero is sort of this like d detecting or not detecting, or there's a lot of something. Um, and you can see there's just a much larger range in the normalized rather than the baseline. Um, same, same with the bandwidth, it's like, you can see the bandwidth is just very, very high for the raw data. That means it's just noisy all the time. You have like a large band of frequencies all the time, whereas the cleaned audio makes more sense that you have sometimes you have noise and sometimes you don't, and it's just this will this will help us I think more. 
um, as well as zero crossing and centroid. I'm not sure how useful these will be, um, but I think we're going to run through all of them and see um, see what happens um, in the model. And zero crossing is like what you what you can imagine from the name, which is just the rate at which the signal changes from like positive to negative. Um, and then the centroid is sort of like how do you characterize a spectrum and sort of like this the central the central point of the mass of sound and i i think hunter mentioned this it's like sort of like brightness of a sound um and so that's where we are now um sort of looking at these audio features and we've already run into challenges because our hardware is kind of hard to stay consistent. Um, I think we need to make a new box. We need to figure out the microphones and how to like keep them consistent. Do we actually super glue piezo microphones to the back of a piece of wood? Or do we want it to be more portable and we have more procedure of using the current AKGs? And sort of like, how do we collect more data? Like, should it just only be me you know, um, should it should it be generalizable to other people drawing as well, not just me? Um, that's something that we're thinking about, and um, yeah. And this one is still a question. Like I said, like the model one versus the model two, like real time versus batch processing, and. For performance, actually both work. Real time, obviously, you would think works best for performance, but for for batch processing, it can also work because as a musician, we have to memorize stuff all the time. So I can just memorize exactly what was in my input data and say, like, say I'm drawing at this time a triangle and a square, and I do exactly that in the performance. That means my fixed video that's been generated will synchronize with my performance. And in performance, people rarely notice the difference unless you tell them, like, as long as there's there's a lot of synchronization. And even if there's not a lot, I feel like our brains really put two things together. Um, it's It helps us see the world. It's like if something's moving and there's something, an, an audio event, then we, we think, oh, they're related. Um, so that's helpful that my audience it's going to be humans rather than machines. Um, and uh, yeah, and and another thing that I think everyone must be thinking about is sort of like, how do we get people together on a team from different disciplines? I'm so thankful for Irfan and Alex because they've, they went to school in a time where AI was just widely taught. And they have just have so much more experience, and it's so nice to have them on the team. And how do we get scientists and artists to talk together more, um, and to do, you know, useless but fun things? Useless. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're useless. I'm using useless as a positive term. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, but, okay. So enough about this model. I just want to show sort of some, like this was just released um, like a week ago, or no, like two weeks ago now, three weeks ago. And I just wanted to show some of the things that now OpenAI can do, and like we can have a discussion maybe about, about it. And so this is the prompt, and um, this is what their model generates. It's pretty darn good. And same with this one. Like a lot of, you can do different camera angles. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it still has some problems with physics, I suppose. But um, but it's pretty, pretty good. <laughs> Um, 
And this was part of our consideration, actually. In the beginning, when we were thinking about the model, we were saying, well, you know what we could do is, all you really need to do is get X, Y data, and we can generate video. Put a, put a filter on the data using OpenAI, and we can create like a really fun video of people drawing, of like hands drawing. And that's really not the point of this, I think. It's not about putting a filter, it's about sort of testing the limits of creating a model yourself. Um, and I think a lot of people are thinking about this, and I just wanted to sort of talk about some things that are current. There's a petition right now that you can sign. It's at sites.mit.edu slash AI Safe Harbor. And you, it's, it's talking about sort of like, we need independent evaluation of these models, of the data being used. We, like these companies like OpenAI, you know, they're not beholden to a lot of laws really yet. Um, and uh, maybe these companies should protect people um, whose data is being used. And there's one company now called Fairly Trained and they provide certifications about um, like certain, certain models if they're using, if they get data in an ethical way or if it's scraped from the internet. Um, like one example right now is that if you all know Google Magenta, they were, for a long time, they were just using open source data. They were very clear about their data practices. Like it was really inspiring, open source, like if there was a community involved. And now I think something called Lyria, is that right? It's like in the works. It's essentially just music generation. It's not available yet, but it they've, they've trained it on people's data without telling them. And then they show them, see like how cool it is. Like I think John Legend was maybe cited as an example. Like, look how cool, like we can use your data and like we can make this really cool song for you and then ask for permission after. So that's like sort of what AI has been doing is like um, do it first and then ask for forgiveness later instead of really from the ground up trying to be very ethical about their data practices. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> you'll see, you'll hear a lot of circles after the break. Um, and maybe it'll be a wild ride. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. That was super fascinating. And it's super interesting to see your focus on sort of personalized network as it's like the opposite of this like mass sourced like data. So that's super cool. Um, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, if you would like it, the restroom is out in the room you entered in. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll have, we'll dim the lights as you were talking about, and we're going to listen to about a half hour long eight channel piece that Julie has for us. Um, and, um, yeah, please feel free to ask me any questions. I just realized I need to mention here, um, thank you to, uh, Excel Enterprise, to University of Michigan Arts Engine, and to Media the Foundation for supporting the series. Um, and a huge thank you to Kate and Troy and everyone at ESS for engineering and providing a home for this. Can we like thank ESS real quick? <laughs> cool. So we'll take a quick break, change setup, and in like five, ten minutes we'll be back.
to imagine this, but I'm inside of a box with a pencil with seven microphones inside the box, and that's what's happening. <laughs> um, so.
for listening. Thank you so much for presenting that. I was very lost for most of the kind of different ones. Um, yeah, thank you again, Julie. That was amazing. Thank you all for coming uh, to this third week of Chicago Creative Machines. Um, another shout out to Kate and Troy for engineering and to ESS for hosting. <laughs> definitely has me thinking about different modalities and new ways. That was super inspiring. Um, next week is our final week of Chicago Creative Machines, and I appreciate, I know a number of you have come back repeatedly. I hope you find uh, all of these artists super inspiring. Next week we have X.A. Lee, who is here right now, um, who is a multidisciplinary artist and computer scientist based here in Chicago. And let me make sure I get the verbiage right here. Um, I say we'll discuss how emerging methods in artificial intelligence across domains can serve as tools in original creative processes beyond the limited forms of, quote, AI art, popularized by consumer-grade generative tools. Um, and then she will present recent work involving video, sound, and custom software she's built. So uh, come back next week at the same time uh, for XA Lee. And uh, thank you again, ESS, and to Julie. And thank you, Molly, for organizing. <laughs> Yeah. Have a good afternoon. Go take a nap to make up for the lost hour. <laughs> <laughs>